We're going to get started in minutes. I want to make sure that everyone has a ballot in their hand. If you don't, you could raise your hand. I think Casey is getting ballots out. She will bring you one. And then there are packets of information for today's meeting in the window sills. Um, there are also packets of information for today's meeting coming off here as we speak. So if it looks like we don't have enough, more will be arriving shortly. I am going to open the meeting with a prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, source of all wisdom and understanding, be present with those of us who take counsel in St. Andrew's Church for the renewal and mission of your church. Teach us in all things to seek first your honor and glory. Guide us to perceive what is right and grant us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. First of all, thank you all for being here. I see that we finally crept up out of single-digit temperatures. This morning my dogs were convinced they wanted to go outside until I opened the door. <laughs> I was convinced I wanted to go outside until I opened the door, so I'm very glad that you're here this morning. According to our bylaws, a quorum for the annual meeting consists of either 25 people or 10% of our active membership. So we have clearly 25 people this morning, so we are good. Um, our agenda this morning is the identification of a parliamentarian and Jeff Bowen is seated in the back pew back there on the left to assist us should we come up against any issues with Robert's rules or need clarification on how we proceed with this meeting. The next thing on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the 2021 meeting. They start on the second page of your packet. In fact, they are all on the second page of your packet. And so uh, I ask at this point if anyone has any amendments, adjustments, or questions about the minutes to the, for the 2021 annual meeting. Seeing none, I would accept a a motion to approve the minutes as presented. And Ann Allen, we need a second. Kevin Featherston Crow has seconded it. Any further discussion? And all in favor of adopting the minutes for the 2021 annual meeting as presented, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Next item on our agenda is the annual meeting. Um, in your packet, you have a report from the nominating committee describing um, the efforts that they made in order to put together a slate of candidates for today's election. 
regarding the particulars for today's elections. Um, our wardens, both senior and junior warden, um, who served one term, have elected to run again this year. And they are allowed to hold up to three consecutive terms. For both of them, this would be a second year. We need to elect three people to three-year terms on the vestry, and we need to name an alternate. We have four candidates running, so all four will be elected today. One will be an alternate, and then the other three will be members of the vestry beginning on January 1st. We need to do the same thing in the diocese and convention, elect four deputies to convention and name an alternate. And again, we have five candidates, so all five will be elected. Four will be named as convention deputies beginning January 1, and the other will stand ready as an alternate. For the endowment committee, Tegarachi has been serving the sec second year of a three-year term. Um, the person who was originally elected to that term had to step down for health reasons. Our bylaws indicate that if an alternate steps in, they serve for the remainder of that year of the next annual meeting, and then we need to hold an election for the remainder of that outstanding term. So this morning, we need to elect one person to a three-year term and one person to fill out the last year of that three-year term, which was vacated at the beginning of this year. We have two candidates running for endowment committee, um, and so both of them will be elected. One will serve... Does sound like I'm talking about prison? And the, and the other will serve a year term. So... Here we go. We will now consider the candidates for senior warden. And as I said, our bylaws state that a senior warden is elected for a one-year term. The person may hold that office for three consecutive years. It's my pleasure to tell you that Casey Reiser, who has served as senior warden for the last year, has agreed to run for a second term. At this moment, there are no additional candidates. Are there any nominations on the floor for the position of senior warden? There being none, Casey Reiser is the only candidate. Therefore, I ask that we by acclamation to affirm Casey Reiser's election for next senior warden. Just a one-year term, and then you're out. <laughs> and now you're up. I guess we need that before I could do this. This um, next item on the ballot is selection of a junior warden um, who is elected for a one-year term and may hold office for three consecutive terms. Um, a great pleasure to tell you that David Paulette, who has served as junior warden for the last year, has agreed to run for a second term. And uh, there are no other candidates. Uh, for junior warden is David Paulette. Um, are there any nominations from the floor? There being none, I ask, oh, do we mark? No, no bad, okay. Um, none, I ask you to vote by acclamation for David Paulette for junior warden. <laughs> Yay! So, David Pallett, your junior warden for the next year. Um, okay. So, for the diocesan convention, or mine in the wrong order? Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, we are now Moving on to uh, nominations for the vestry, both David and I were in the first year of our three-year terms on the vestry when we became junior and senior warden. Um, that's from a year ago, isn't it? Okay, so never mind. Finishing, never mind that. The vestry is full. Um, finishing three-year terms on the vestry are Darcy Becker, Ben Goji, and Jeff Bowen. Thank you, Darcy, Ben, and Jeff and please give them a round of applause. 
So we are electing three people to serve three-year terms on the vestry and one person to serve as an alternate. Um, the highest vote will serve the three-year terms. The candidates are Patterson, Joanne Lehman, Dennis Lloyd, and Jeff, I won't get your name right. Oh, Dwea. Are there any nominations from the floor? Um, therefore, there being none, I ask that you mark your ballots to serve on the vestry. I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Got them. I see most people looking up, so we'll move on to people to serve as deputies to di the diocesan convention. Um, deputies are elected to a one-year term. Our deputies convention were Margaret Butler, Lindsay Campbell, Carolyn Chatterton, and Kate Romaine. Thanks to all of them. Please give them a round of applause. So we are four people to serve a one-year term and one person to serve as an alternate. The candidates for diocesan convention deputies are Carolyn Chatterton, Stephanie Elkins, Karen evans Romain, Janet Hyde, and Casey Reiser. Are there any from the floor? There being none, please mark four people to serve as diocesan convention deputies. Seeing most people looking up from their ballot, we now move on to the election of two people to serve on the endowment committee. Um, endowment committee serve a three-year term with one member rotating off each year. Finishing a three-year term on the endowment committee is Sherry Reams. Thank you, Sherry. Over there. Manjula Hedarachi has served on the endowment committee this past year, completing his, the second year of a three-year term for someone who needed to step down from the committee earlier that, this year. Our bylaws state that an alternate completes the term they are called up to serve, and that at the next annual meeting, we must elect someone to serve the remaining unfilled term. Thank you, Manjula. We are therefore electing a three-year term and one person to serve a one-year term on the endowment committee. Our bylaws state that uh, endowment committee members may serve up to two consecutive terms. The candidates for the endowment committee are Judy Mills and Jerry Reams. The highest vote getter will serve the three-year term. Are there any nominations from the floor? Thank you, David. Thank you. <laughs> there being none, I ask you to mark your ballot for one candidate, if I had read just one page further. And once you've completed your ballot, fold them in half and pass towards the center aisle for um, Aaron and Katie to collect. No, I will. Done for a minute.
Anyone else still have a ballot they need to turn in? Okay, moving along the agenda, the next is the 2022 State of the Parish Report. As I prepared to offer this, my 16th State of the Parish Report, I was tempted to say that this will be a report unlike any other that I have ever given. Two and a half years of pandemic, streaming recorded services on Facebook and Zoom, streaming on YouTube, online gatherings for celebrations, and even funerals. These past few years have been a thing all unto themselves. And yet the core message that I am sharing today is much the same as the message that it has been my privilege to share with you these past many years. St. Andrews is strong and great. We are smaller than we were when we met for our annual meeting back in 2019, but just two Sundays ago on All Saints Sunday, we had the highest Sunday morning attendance, not counting Easter Sunday, that we've had since Christmas Eve of 2019. That same Sunday, we launched a retooled in-person church school with five kids in the kindergarten through second grade class and seven kids in the third through fifth grade class. And today, the youth group will gather in the parish hall after church to bake cookies and next Sunday evening, they'll gather downstairs in the parish hall for dinner, conversation, some games, and a little bit of learning thrown in for good measure. We are also sharing our space. Folks are, folks are meeting here in person during the week, and we're gathering at St. Andrew's Benedictine Cell Group. We're gathering for a people 101. We're gathering to discuss the creative by which Ken Stancer created the Regent Mass, the service music that we're singing today. The outreach group has gathered folks in the parish hall to discuss the impact of systemic racism and asked us to think about new ways to ways that policies both at the local and federal level have created a wealth gap, a generational wealth gap, between the black and the white communities here in Madison. I'll just tell you that the first time that I gathered in the parish hall with a group of people from St. Andrews after this long time away, it almost brought tears to my eyes. In the past year, St. Andrews has, through our monthly in-gatherings and through the discretionary fund, given over $41,000 to ministries, programs, families, and individuals here in Madison. That amount is equal to 9% of our annual operating expense. We host AA groups, a Cub Scout pack, and offer our facilities for music recitals and concerts. And this year, we are sharing the Newell House with West High School's Blue Lion program, a credit Every program for girls who are in danger of not graduating. Now, note that I said that we're sharing that space. We are offering that space as a gift to the community, to West High School, and to the young women who need an alternative learning program so that they can finish their high school education. When we remodeled this space and renovated our building a few years ago, we said that we wanted this space to be a resource for the community, and we are living into that vision. Walk through those red doors on a Sunday morning, and you can feel the Holy Spirit in this place. There is a sweet, sweet spirit in this been changed by the pandemic, and God willing, it never will. But these past two years, years and two years and a half, they have changed us. Walk through those red doors on a Sunday morning and you can't miss the fact that there are fewer of us here on Sunday mornings. Back in 2019, our average Sunday attendance, or ASA, was 137. The next year, 
2020, we were only able to gather in person from January through March 19th before the pandemic forced us to suspend in-person worship. And our average Sunday attendance that year was 123. In June of 2020, we started to gather in person here in the building and our ASA for the remainder of 2021, from June through December, was 73. Now, more numbers, and I know that I'm not comparing apples to apples, but if we look at the average Sunday attendance for September and October of this year, we see an ASA of 80 and 88, and then like I said, on November 6, on All Saints Sunday, we saw 142 people here in the pews. I know that statistics can be used and manipulated to slant their interpretation, and I'll admit that comparing fully to ASA for just single months, that might be a suspect. But bear me out for a moment. The ASA we reported in 2020 and 2021 were actually for partial years. They only reflected the part of the year when we were to gather in person. And while we have been gathering in person since June of 2021, it wasn't until this fall that we changed our policy saying that masks are welcome but not mandatory at St. Andrews. And since homecoming in September, we've been working towards in-person church school, and this fall began offering formation and fellowship offerings. So this fall feels like a relaunch, a new start. And measuring our average Sunday attendance as we begin anew feels like a way to measure the vitality and the spirit in this place, in this season, at this time. From that perspective, an ASA of 80 and then a All Saints Sunday attendance of 142 feels like real progress. It feels like momentum has shifted back to our side of the field. And when you combine that with that ever-blowing wind, the Holy Spirit that's in this place, we have a lot for which to be and even excited. Of course, as is always the case, you're sailing a boat that's being driven by the wind of the there are lots of that has are yet to be answered with our ASA down we have to wonder where people are have some members of our community drifted away over these past two and a half years are we all still here but just attending less frequently Despite my best efforts to keep track of who's here from week to week, I have to admit that I just can't tell. I'm not sure how many people have left. At the same time, we have new people walking through our doors every week, and those folks seem more ready to engage than new folks that we've greeted in years past. I think that after these past few years, there's a real spiritual hunger that's driving people to look for meaningful engagement, community, and a way to make sense of the world around us. I also think that our live stream allows people to pre-vet us in ways that weren't possible before. For a church, community can log in on Sunday morning and experience the liturgy, hear the music and the preaching, and get a good sense of who we are and how we experience and treat one another in this place, and how we experience God here on Sunday morning. Those of us who are regular church attenders, I think, can forget all too easily how scary it is to walk through the door of the church for the first time. And I think that our live stream lowers the barriers that first trips through the doors of a church so hard. So with all of that, what is it that we are called to do and to be in this place? We ask those same questions every year. Who's here? Who's not? What is God calling us to do? We ask them every year, and our history tells us 
that in this town, where state government and the university are major employers, we turn over about 50 people a year. 50 people graduate, take new jobs, feel called to other communities, and some folks in this community die. And each year, for the whole time I've been here, 50 more people arrive, keeping our membership and our attendance pretty stable. Here, I think, is likely to be different, just as the past two and a half years have been different. I don't think we can count on that balanced exchange of folks in and folks out, because there are new factors at play, new drivers in the equation, and the stasis that we've experienced may be a thing of the past. That means a renewed level of attention and who are we? Who's still here? Who are the newer members of our community? What do we, those of us who have been here for a while and those of us who have recently arrived, need and want from the community at 1833 Regent Street? What questions are we asking of God in our new context, in a community, city, and nation, in a world that continues to be changed at a stunning and sometimes overwhelming pace. Most importantly, what is God calling us to do in this place at this time for the people within these walls and within the many consensus of community to which God has bound us? What is God calling us to do, to be, as we begin as a community to discern God's call to us, as we engage the new mission statement that this community crafted to describe itself, and which we'll hear more about in a few minutes. As we look to the needs of our community and the community around us, we'll need to take stock of the resources we have available, both financial and human, to support the work we're called to do that our pledged revenue hasn't taken as big a hit as our average students. And I wonder why people who are no longer active are still making pledge payments to St. Andrews. Are they doing it out of a sense of duty or nostalgia? It's possible that this year, with the inflationary pressures we're all experiencing, people may decide that this is the last year that they give out of nostalgia or duty. And I have to say that I don't believe that we've seen the full financial impact of the pandemic yet. Needless to say, this will impact the work that we undertake in the coming year. The resources will, of necessity, determine how much we do who is here, the makeup, the demographics and needs of the people will determine what we need to do. Turn the page. All of that being said, I think that we're going to learn a lot from this year's stewardship campaign. In addition to gathering and assessing the resources with the ministry in the coming year, we will have the opportunity to do a little data mining to see who is in here and who we've lost. We ask that question as we ask it. There's one loss, though, that we can name. Last year, when Mother Melissa accepted the call to become the rector of St. Thomas of Canterbury in Greendale, we decided not to call another full priest. That seemed like the right decision then, and today we know that it was the right decision. We are projected to end this year with a surplus that's only about half of a second full-time priest's compensation. If we had called another full-time priest to our staff, we would be projecting a deficit of about four dollars this year. So not calling another full-time priest was clearly the right call. Over the past seven or eight years, we have prioritized 
prioritized clergy staff here at St. Andrews. We've chosen to emphasize the pastoral relationships, diversity of preaching and voice, the ability to have both male and female clergy, young and not so young, in our pulpit and at the altar. And that model, that diversity, has served us well. But because we've prioritized clergy staff, the past two associates and I have carried a lot of administrative tasks that don't require a seminary education or a collar. Now that we are a one clergy parish, I simply don't have the time to do the things that do require that education and collar and the administrative tasks that our former associates and I have shared in these past years. Fortunately, we have had some money in the HR line with Mother Lisa's departure, and that's allowed us to call a new parish administrator who has computer skills that surpass mine, thanks be to God, and who can, with just a few more hours, accomplish many of the administrative tasks that have fallen to me and to Mother Melissa. Dylan Thomas has been a fabulous staff, and I hope if and when you have the opportunity to interact with him, you will thank him for all that he's doing for St. Andrews. You may or may not remember from his introduction, he is enrolled in a four-year doctoral program in global leadership. He just started his second year, and so we will have him for at least three years, and if we hold really tight, maybe we'll keep him around for a little bit longer after that. What I want to be sure, though, that we acknowledge here is the loss of people hours devoted to pastoral care, Christian formation, liturgy, preaching, and spiritual direction. Our associates and I were able, even while we were sharing those administrative tasks, to do the work of about 1.75 full-time clergy. How will we cover that 0.75% of a clergy, or that 75% of a clergy FTE, now that we only have one clergy person on staff? That brings up some new questions. Are there people in our midst who can step into those roles, the things that aren't being covered now that Mother Melissa is gone? Are there other ways to do the things that we've been able to do with more staff on board? Are there things that we'll have to let go as we move forward? That 75% is an issue we'll need to continue to address as we discern God's call, our needs, the needs of our community, and as we learn how to be church in our new reality. Turn the page. Change is hard. We will quite appropriately grieve what was, and we will inevitably experience some doubt and resistance to this new reality. We don't yet know who or what we are, what we will become, and what we are called to be. But the change that has come upon us is inexorable. It's the result of forces beyond our control. And the question that confronts us, the challenge that we face, is how we will respond, how we will adapt to our new context, our new reality. How will we respond to this moment in this place at this time? Technical fixes, new programs, new things to do. It's too soon to suggest technical fixes. The changes that we do as the changes that we will eventually implement to keep us whole, the body of Christ continuing to do Christ's work here on the near west side of Madison. We don't yet have enough data to name the new programs, teachings, and practices that we'll need in the days and months to come. But what is clear, and what we do know now, and we have lots of data to support this, is we need to change the ways that we listen, process, discern and respond 
to the data that we're now receiving. We're not ready for a technical solution, but we surely need an adaptive response to what's happening around us and within our walls. This is liminal space, liminal time. The roadmaps that we used to navigate the world have either disappeared or lost their meaning. The benchmarks and landmarks we use to help us know where we are have been moved or replaced with unfamiliar standards. We're no longer what we were, and we're no, not yet what we are to become. That's the definition of liminal space, liminal time. A time of transition where the old is no longer available, useful, or relevant, and the new is not yet clear, understood, or even available. We are in that space, and we're in it along with all of the parishes of the Episcopal Diocese of Milwaukee, the state of Wisconsin, and beyond. We're in that space with churches across denominations and around the world. And like all of those communities, large and small, local and far away, we need to be patient, to pay attention to what we see, hear, and feel, and to have faith in the God who has and will show us the way to the new creation that God is bringing to fruition in our midst. The adaptive response that's required of us in this liminal time to remain faithful, trusting in God's providence, to trust the journey and not rush prematurely to technical solutions that might ease our discomfort, but in the present, while in the long term, causing more problems as the future continues to unfold. The challenge we face at this time is to be intentionally attentive to the changes, both subtle and obvious, in ourselves, in the people in our midst, and in our context, the world around us. We are challenged to look for new signposts that God will be placing in our path and to hold one another up as we travel this road together, knowing that our strength lies in community and communion with one another. The technical fixes, the specific changes that we need to make will present themselves along the way, and we'll need to consider them carefully, discerning their utility and fit for our community. But the most important response we can make in the moment in which we find ourselves in this liminal space and time is to be open, willing to change the way we listen, see, discern, and love all in service to God's call to us and God's dream and vision for all creation. And if all of that sounds more than a little daunting right now, let me remind you that the momentum has shifted back to our side of the field. And combined with that momentum is that ever-blowing wind, the Holy Spirit that is moving in this place. And we have a lot for which to be grateful and excited and we can rest in the assurance that we do not travel this path alone. So now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and love of Christ and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be amongst us, and remain with us always. Amen. Mission statement thing? Okay. Um, they're going to finalize the ballot counting. They need to add in the absentee ballots. So David Paulette and I um, will move on to the mission statement, which has been unveiled in your packet. A few things I want to say about that. Um, when we first began 
crafting a new mission statement, we used every available resource to us, um, some surveys, some other formats, um, but mostly it was your voices that were listened to and heard. I think it's important to identify the three themes that came from all of that data gathering. Um, one being that we gather and certainly aspire to gather inclusively. Why do we gather? To renew our spirit. And how do we leave? Or, or we leave our gathering to serve each other and to serve our community with compassion and love. Um, using these, and I hope you saw those themes in Father Andy's report that he just gave, and I hope you see them in this mission statement, which will help us as we prioritize and strategize in the coming years. So that statement, and I've got to ask you to read it. <laughs> All right. I love it. So. All right. So um, I'm just going to read what hopefully you can read in your packet as well. Um, and it is, all are welcome. Nourished by God's love, we follow Christ's example of service to each other and our community. What? Are we taking questions or not? Uh, well, we have a few minutes to take questions or comments. I personally would like to, th okay, uh, first I'd like to thank the mission statement committee, which is Katie, Terry, David, um, and John Mullen. So. speak into this thing. Can you hear me? Um, I wanted to thank the mission statement committee and particularly Father Andy for setting a tone in this community that I think came through in the report really well. And that tone that I appreciate is the tolerance of anxiety of not knowing where we are right now and where we're going and rather than jumping forward into some action that we might that might not fit us or that we later regret, the putting it into words of saying, well, we're in liminal space and here we are, and we're gonna hold each other and work our way through it and we'll find our way. And I think having Father Andy be able to say that for us sets the groundwork for all of us to feel more comfortable and more bonded in this community working together. So I thank everybody, and I thank Andy for setting that tone. Any other comments, questions? If not, thank you for all your input. Appreciate it. Um, we, I can now present the election results, um, members of New members of the vestry will be um, Jeff, Dennis, and Joanne, and Carolyn is the alternate. The diocesan convention deputies 
will be Stephanie Elkins, Karen Evans Romaine, Janet Hyde, Carolyn Chatternet, and I am the alternate. The endowment committee, the three year term, will be Judy Mills, and the one year term is Sherry Reams. Thank you all for being willing. So there are, <clears throat> there are a number of reports in your packet. You have the annual stewardship campaign update, and a, a report from the endowment committee, from the columbarium trustees, from the junior warden, and an outreach giving update. And we have 10 minutes scheduled to answer questions that you might have about any of those reports. And if I could get somebody, David, would you? Oh, the junior warden report is not in the packet. I am very sorry. It's, it's there, is, there is a junior warden report, but it was censored. So it did not go in the packet. <laughs> it was redacted. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any questions? That is on our website, so you'll be able to see it there. Mary Hastings. So this is actually for you, Dave. So, <laughs> so where are we with the Newell House, and what are we thinking we want to do with the Newell House? I know we haven't had the meeting, but where, what are the thoughts at this time? Great question. So one of the things that I want to make sure that we are thinking about from the Newell House standpoint, especially given uh, what Father Andy said about the budget and given the condition of the Newell House right now and the use patterns of the Newell House, is that we start putting together a plan for how we want to utilize that space uh, going forward in the future. So if we are going to continue to make it a shared space, if we're going to have other uh, organizations that are going to be utilizing that space, um, there is probably going to have to be additional work done on that space because there's a lot of, um, I, I would just call it uh, technical challenges with it. So for example, anybody who has stepped on the back porch of that space has taken their life into their own hands. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and so we need to have a very thoughtful plan for how we want to utilize that space in support of our mission uh, moving forward. So I've, uh, I have had a request for some people to get together so that we can meet to talk about how do we use that space, how do we look forward with that space so that we can put together a two, three year plan uh, on that. That uh, unfortunately we have not been able to meet together as a, as a committee I'm hoping to get that uh, going in the next um, couple of weeks or so. And uh, at that point, then we would want to present a recommendation to the vestry for a plan to be approved for how we, we're going to utilize that space. In the meantime, we've done some kind of um, what I would say is kind of uh, basic things that needed to be done. So for example, we cleared out the playground equipment because there were some safety concerns with it. Um, there was some erosion going on in there, and we've taken care of that. We also know that there's additional erosion in the back, or there, the retaining wall is actually starting to, to rot, and that's going to need to be addressed sometime very soon in the future as well. So that will all be part of the consideration of how we're going to look at that space. Up, up front here, David. Ooh. just wondering if you have some sort of an idea of, or are you working on, towards an idea of how much it's going to cost to bring that building up to, to anything near code? Um, I refuse to give a dollar figure for that. <laughs> um, it, is, it is, I'm going to say it's more than $10,000 and it's probably less than $3 million, but <laughs> somewhere in that range. You know, it, 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 part of it is going to depend on what we end up doing to the space. So if, a lot of that space is out of code. And depending on what is the right thing to do with that space, to bring it up to code, uh, or the type of repairs that we may need to do to it, or enhancements that we do to it, may require us to bring things up to code. So uh, kind of the, the, the most uh, extreme example is that the staircases, the slope is way too, way too sharp. If we do some significant repair, I suspect that what's going to have to end up happening is that we're going to have to lower the, the rise of the stairs. We don't have the space in the current building to be able to do that effectively. So we would have to think about something like 
do we extend out the back of the building so we have enough staircase uh, to be able to meet those, those requirements? So those are all the things we're gonna have to think about as we look forward at uh, what that would be. So if we go down to that level, I think we're, we're definitely talking about a significant amount of money if we end up going down that path. And, and Doug is my conscience here and he's nodding very vigorously. <laughs> so I haven't said anything incorrect. Is this question for me? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Just a quick question on the on outreach. Is our plan to um, give to Madison Roots as the need arises as we go along, or is there a, like an annual giving plan? So the um, the committee that is working on that is is still grappling and thinking through how all of that will work. We did back in August, I think, make a decision that we would have all of the in-gatherings for the rest of the year go to Roots. And then we started to worry about some of the other ministries that the in-gathering has supported over the years. So we backed away from that and said that we would do every other month for Roots um, and that we would try to have that and I don't think we've decided yet, be on the same month where we had a learning opportunity or some other event, or have it be in the off months, um, we're still trying to figure that out. But we are, I mean, if you look at that list, we are still supporting quite a few other ministries in town. So the charge from the vestry was to find a, a black-led ministry in town with whom we could partner to leverage our resources, our power, and our privilege to make a significant difference in the racial disparities here in Madison. And so right off the bat, one of the things that we thought we needed to do was to sort of trim down the number of things that we supported and to focus a lot of our resources, power, and privilege on a single ministry or issue area so that we could make that significant difference. And I think we're still trying to find the right balance and figure out how that works. Um, I will tell you that the $8,000 from the clergy discretionary funds um, came up just this last month. Our policy here is that I help folks once a quarter for up to $100. There are a couple of people with whom we've been in relationship for quite a while whose needs I know and I bend that rule for them. But if you look at the current discretionary fund balance of $19,000, it would take me an awful lot of time to hand that out in $100 increments once a quarter to folks. And so giving a big chunk of that to Little John's Kitchen was a way to use that money responsibly to help a ministry here in town. I'll also tell you that you look at all these nice round numbers here for the money that we've given to different ministries and they're round because we've used money from the discretionary fund to round them up. So we're, we're still working on that. I have a question about the Newell House. It seems to me that the um, need for repairs is, is going to be extremely expensive. And if we want to continue to have that facility be available to the neighborhood, we kind of have an obligation to look into and get going with the essential repairs. I'm wondering if the new administrative assistant would have time to look into grants from the city. Uh, I, I believe there is money available at the city level for this kind of thing, depending on how you draw the circle around what we're going to do with the, with the house once it's fixed but I don't think it's very realistic to think that St. Andrews can pay for, even over three years. I don't think we can pay for it, maybe we could pay for it over 30 years, um, but I doubt that that's something that we would want to do. I think the costs are very high for what the house needs, but it's a really valuable property, um, so we should keep it and fix it and try to get other people to help pay for that. I think that that would be a great thing if we could make that happen, Darcy. Maybe you and, and David can talk about that and then see where that effort should rest. 
As a matter of fact, I, I think my summary of what you just said is that you want to be on the new old house committee. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. you. I'll put you on the email list this afternoon. So I, I just want to note that we are just a little bit past the time we were supposed to take up the financial reports. Does anybody else have a pressing question that they would like to, to raise now? All right, then I'm going to invite Kevin to come up. Good morning. I am Kevin Featherston Crow, for those who I have not had the privilege of meeting yet. Um, I am in the process of assuming the treasurer position from Mark Cook, who served for many, I believe 13 years? I, I, I many years. Uh, okay, so many years as the, of service as the treasurer, and it has been a process we've gone through this year, and I appreciate all the help that Mark has provided, Father Andy, Dylan, um, it has really been a group effort to get through this year as so much has changed and so many unknowns have been uh, addressed. Not everybody likes numbers and I don't intend to stand here and recite all the numbers that you have in your packets that you can very easily read for yourself. What I want to do is take us back a little bit and tell the story of how we have uh, dealt with our financial position over the last few years. In your agenda, it says we'll start with the 2021 review. Actually, I want to step just a little bit further back to 2020 and remind everybody where we were at in the midst of the pandemic, in its early offing, actually, uh, and that through the PPP program, the pay, uh, Paycheck Protection Program offered by the federal government, we were able to obtain additional funds to maintain our, um, our services and ministries through the, the midst of that heavy period of the pandemic. Moving forward to 2021, we were able to obtain forgiveness of that loan. That was a part of the program that was built in. Through that forgiveness in 2021, and this is probably the last time you'll hear about PPP, uh, we were able to end the year 2021 with a surplus. Total income last year was $553,000. I'll round these numbers, you can see the detail in your packet. Our total expenses were about 510,000, and that left us with excess income of $43,365. Those funds helped us weather the storm of the pandemic, build up our rainy day fund, and keep us in a, in a good financial position. Without that PPP loan forgiveness, and again, last time you'll hear this, we would have been in a deficit position of almost $6,000. So while we ended 2021, last year, in a good position, it could have been much different and I hope that you take that away as, take, the takeaway of that is that um, we have weathered that storm. That brings us to this year where things are still in the midst of uncertainty. Um, where we are at so far this year, the financial numbers provided in your packet represent 75% of the year, this goes through September 30th, so 75% of the budget progress. As of September, We've received $380,000 in contributions, which is 77% of our budget, so slightly ahead. That's actually a very good number. And our total income is $384,000, which is 78%. So we add in some interest income, some other miscellaneous income. So from the income side, we are in a very good position. On the expense side, we are also in a very healthy position through the, the, the careful stewardship of our budget numbers by the vestry. Again, you can read through all the detail in the packet, but the bottom line is that for most line items, we are at that 75% range. So for the most part, we are on track with our 2022 budget as of September 30th. The two places that you will notice significant differences are in those areas where we have had to delay return to our, um, our programs, particularly in fellowship and in the learning and program expenses. Those are the formation programs. We've not been operating those this year, so you will see that they are significantly behind budget. 
not an intentional thing in terms of a, of a cost savings perspective, but just nonetheless a reality as it affects our bottom line. So as of September 30th, we have total expenses of 333,000. So we had 384,000 in income. So we now are currently in a position of having excess income of almost $51,000. The question now is, where do we go forward into 2023? Your eyes do not deceive you. You will notice that the budget presented to you this morning shows numbers very similar to the ones that were presented last year, and that was intentional. When the executive committee discussed how to approach the budget for next year, and when we presented that draft budget to the vestry, it was done through a a philosophy of maintaining our current levels of ministry and service next year. We are not mind, uh, ignorant of the fact that a dollar in 2023 is going to purchase far less than it did in 2022, 2022 through the effects of things like inflation. Uh, but the approach to the budget was maintain what we have, see where we are, I'll refer you back to Father Andy's uh, presentation earlier of the period that we are in of change and what are we going to be as a parish in 2023, where will those financial resources be directed? So for the most part, 2023's draft budget, and I want to be very clear, draft means draft, not final draft, not middle draft, it's the very beginning draft, uh, it keeps everything as constant as possible with a few known exceptions. First of all, uh, there was an overall cost of living adjustment of a, and I will say that in 2022, this is a modest 5% increase that was approved at diocesan conventions. So the uh, payroll, the human resources line on your, on your uh, draft budgets does show that 5% increase. Again, in 2023, there is no provision for an associate director, so you will not see expenses related to that position. And the other significant known change at this time was the increase of our diocesan assessment from $83,792 to $86,360. Those are our known increases at this time. Anything else will come through uh, discussion with the uh, Finance Committee over the next few weeks and the Vestry at its upcoming meetings with the final budget adopted in January. If all of our budget targets are met, the income that you see on your draft has a 0% increase over last year. There is a lot of unknown and uncertainty about that. If you look at the stewardship update in your packets, you'll notice that at this point, uh, we are at $336,280 in received pledges. That does put us behind where we were last year. Are more to come? I hope so. If you have pledge cards, please return them. Um, but again, Father Andy's discussion earlier uh, reflected the fact that we don't know exactly who is still with us and how much people are able to afford. So we do have uncertainty as to the top section of the budget, that being the income say. Going to the expense side, if our targets are met, our total expenses for 2023 would be at 454,000, which is a 1.8 increase over 2022, reflecting those known increases that I mentioned a moment ago. When the income is taken in and the expenses subtracted out, according to the budget draft, there is an excess of $37,000. That is 17.9% decrease over 2022. That is just a number on paper at this point. Whether that number comes, comes to pass depends completely on the contributions that are received, the expenses that we can absorb, changes that are made, and decisions that have to be made by the Finance Committee and ultimately the Vestry over the coming weeks. So although there is a significant decrease from 2023, uh, I'm sorry, from 2022 to 2023, there is nonetheless a positive number foreseen at this point. That allows us to continue to build our rainy day fund and make other changes that may be on the horizon. Given our current uncertainty, this is a good result as we look at it today. 
now that the stewardship season is starting to come to a close, uh, the Finance Committee will begin reviewing the budget in much more detail and crafting the final budget proposal to be presented to the vestry in January. So the story, like I said at the beginning, that I hope to express here is that this is one of hope and support and endurance as we have transitioned through the pandemic era, not that it's done, uh, but as we start to look forward to where we will begin to build or rebuild or reopen or continue to do so in 2023. And with that, those are my remarks. Are there any questions? Before we start to entertain questions, I just want to reiterate what Kevin said, that this is a first draft that will be revised between now and the end of January when we have to adopt a budget for 2022. Um, the vestry will meet on December the 14th, and then again on the last Wednesday of January, and that date is beyond my recall at this moment. But you all are welcome. All vestry meetings are open to all members of the parish. So you're welcome to come to either of those meetings and offer suggestions or ask questions. You're also welcome to send your questions via email um, to the vestry. You can send them to Casey or to me or to David, and we will make sure that Kevin and the Finance Committee address them and we will respond to those questions. A, a budget is a moral document. It reflects our priorities and our values. It says a lot about who we are as a community. And so I, I hope that as you look at this draft, you'll keep that in mind and that you'll think about the budget in that way. Does this express who we are? Does this tell the story of St. Andrews? Um, we would value all of those questions, all of that input. Um, so please do. If you have a question, a suggestion, if you have an issue with the budget as, it, as this draft presents it, please do be in touch. And then we've got a few minutes to answer any questions that, that you would like to raise at this time. Your first question is from Manjula. Just a quick question on the bottom line here. I mean, I'm just adding up, you know, the bottom line from the last three, four years. And hopefully, you know, if we keep going the way we have this year, if we add it up, it's over $100,000 in excess. Um, does the vestry have any thought of maybe taking that money out and keeping it separate, like in a couple of maybe CDs? CD rates are really high right now, 5% for a one-year CD. Just keep it separate so that there will come a day in the future when we might, you know, have a bad year where we'll have this part of money to maybe dip into versus keeping it in the general fund and not earn anything. And also mentally, I think people unfortunately have that thought that if they see a lot of money, ooh, we have this big part of money and you spend it in a certain way versus if it's out of sight, it's in something good, earning interest, you act in it kind of a different way. So um, I think, and we don't have those numbers in front of us this morning, but at the end of this year, if all of these projections um, hold true, we'll have a little over $200,000 in reserves. Um, that number shows up in our budget documents as the general fund. But those are our cash reserves that we have to, to fill gaps, um, to make sure that we have operating money to go forward. And the vestry decided, I can't even tell you how many years ago now, that we should have at least three months of operating expenses in reserve at all times. I think right now that number would be about $125,000. So we have that cash reserve for emergencies, and then we have money in excess of that that's built up over these last couple of years. I, I know that some of our general fund and our reserves is held in CDs, um, so it's not all liquid and immediately available. Um, we haven't had the problem of having this much in reserve in the past, and so whether or not we put additional money in CDs at this point 
I think that's something that we need to explore because this is a new, a new context for us. Anybody else? Mary? I just want to commend you all for doing such a great job as a steward of our funds. It's been a really hard time for all of us at home and a very hard time for the church. So thank you very much. <laughs> and, and I just want to thank Kevin. Um, you know, it's, it's inevitable. Um, when someone holds a job for a long time, systems evolve, grow, change, new systems are implemented. We found this when Dory left. We found this when Ruth left. We found this when Mark retired. Some of those things aren't documented you know, because the same person has held that position for so long and they just know what they know and that's how it works. And so we're working really hard to document, we have an operations manual Google folder. Um, and anytime Dylan asks me a question, the answer goes in there. The internet is out. How do I fix the internet today? Oh, here, here's what you do. Put that in the operations manual folder. So that's happening across the boards. Um, but I think that this transition around finances, because it carries such weight and sense of responsibility has been really stressful. And I'm really grateful, Kevin, for your perseverance and your willing to take this work on um, on our behalf. So. <laughs> All right. Is there anything left on the agenda, Casey? Closing prayer. Closing prayer. Um, so the election results will be online tomorrow. Um, this has been live streamed, which means that we have a recording of it. So this will also be online tomorrow. Um, if you want to go back and revisit something or there's something that you want to share with someone else, please do. It will be out via the parish list serve tomorrow. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this community of fellowship and love of support, hard work, and of laughter. Give us all strength and perseverance as we face the uncertainty of these times and help us to have a deep and abiding sense of your never failing presence. Show us in the faces around us that we are never alone and help us to see in you a companion, a guide, and our destination. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Church starts again in 13 minutes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, Two, I had a very brief conversation with Kevin. He sees light at the end of the tunnel. I think we're good. I think we're good. That's awesome. Thank you, sir. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and congratulations. What's that?